Welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures, Daily Dose of Nature. I'm your host, Sunny Vanderstar. Today's topic is Amazing Maze, the ancient grain that shaped civilization. And it will be presented by our fabulous NatHab expedition leader, Melissa Silva. Melissa, it's so good to see you here today. We haven't seen you in a while. It's great to see your face. Cannot wait to hear what you have to share with us. Let's dive in. Thank you. Thank you, Sunny. Thank you. Yeah, we just uh, we just finished the monarch butterfly season. We have a, a very nice season. I hope you all can join us at least once. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm back here to um, speak to you about the the corn, the maize. Um, I think it's a very important topic. And this is just like a scratch on the surface of everything that you can study and, and learn and read about um, the maize, the corn. So let's start uh, from the beginning. Let's go back in time. Let me just give you some uh, references for you to understand what I will be talking about. Um, so in the, in the world, there are um, the crops that we use nowadays, all the, the plants that we cultivate, uh, they come from wild ancestors. And uh, in the early 1800s, some Russian people, some Russian uh, scientists were saying like, they were, uh, they were wondering where they come from, where these crops were coming from. So um, a, a group of, of those researchers uh, started looking for crops that are, for, for um, plants that were similar to the crops in different areas of the world. And well, through the through the history, with all this research, now scientists define several. Um, we call them centers of origin or centers of diversification that dated back to the something that is called the Neolithic Revolution. That is when um, the the cultures of those times developed the agriculture. They uh, changed from being hunters and and gatherers to be uh, um, to settle down in an area sedentary so well in general we have like eight six different uh, centers of uh, diversification and uh, one of the rules that these scientists decide to have to name uh, one of these centers is that there should be a high diversity of certain crop but also you can find the wild relatives or at least traces of their wild relatives. So one of the centers of origins is uh, Mesoamerica, is this area of um, southern, central southern Mexico and part of Central America, uh, Guatemala, Belize, um, other countries here in Central America that have um, these uh, pre-Hispanic, pre-Columbian um, uh, cultures. From this area, we have several crops that now, now are distributed basically all around the world. Um, for example, very well known, the avocados, the chili peppers, um, the, the squash, for example, the, the pumpkins, but also the one that, that we're going to speak about, the maize, the corn. So according to certain um, archeological, uh, paleontological uh, evidence, the maize domestication started somewhere uh, about 10,000 years ago in, in one of these areas, somewhere in central Mexico, in, in the highland uh, valleys or in the in the Balsas Valley here on the west area of Mexico. How they know we have this uh, domestication starting in, in, in this part of Mexico? Well, because of the of the fossilized evidence in the central balsas valley in the guerrero state there is a, a boulder that makes a shelter underground it's not a cave per se but it's pretty much similar to a cave it's called the shiwatoxla shelter and under that area they found some remains of um, prehistoric inhabitants of the americas they found grinding stones just to, to squash as they smash uh, food and in the stones they found something that uh, the researchers call uh, phytoliths 
uh, basically uh, vegetal fossils, but they were microscopic. These are starch grains that are microscopic found on the on the holes of these uh, uh, grinding stones. So they dated those uh, uh, grains and together with the area, with the settlement area, they determined that this is the oldest um, uh, evidence of maize, of corn, like actual um, species of corn, not the, ance not, not the wild ancestors, but the corn that we know nowadays or, or very similar. So that dated back to almost 9,000 years ago. So that's why the researchers estimate that the domestication of maize from the wild uh, ancestor to what is now what we know now uh, started at least 10,000 years ago another evidence that the the researchers have for saying uh, that mexican area mesoamerican area is the area where we see the first corns as we know it um, nowadays is in the tehuacan valley in puebla state and in a cave named Gilanakits in Oaxaca State. If you have been in Oaxaca, Oaxaca has a, a very um, accidented topography. It has a lot of mountains. There is actually a, the Southern Sierra Madre is in Oaxaca State and part of um, Chiapas State. So in the, all of these um, mountains, there are several caves with archaeological, paleontological este, evidences. And once again, some fossilized cobs in this case, not only uh, microscopic uh, starch grains, but uh, like real uh, cobs. Not very big, no more than 10 centimeters, some of them, but they were able to date them back for um, at least 5,000 years ago uh, in the past. So these are some of the oldest um, evidences that we have that the corn was in this area as uh, the maize that we know even if it was smaller or with different grain disposition but it was the, the corn that we know nowadays from here from this area there's some evidence that uh, the corn not the the ancestor but the corn was moving north and south to the americas um some fossil evidences from Central America, for example, date back to uh, 6,000 years ago. Uh, some others in, in South America, actually, some uh, 7,000 years ago in Northern uh, Americas, in, in the U.S., southern part of the U.S. with the, with the native uh, people. There are evidence, fossil evidence of uh, corn dating back of at least 3,000 years ago. So we have like this dispersion and we see a uh, is the gradient of dates in the in the fossil record. So, as I mentioned, the wild relatives are similar to the domesticated crops that we have nowadays. For example, these are just uh, a bunch of uh, of examples: carrots. Carrots. Now we associated them to be this uh, juicy, big orange root. The original carrot that is still alive nowadays used to be white or even purple, and it was a very it has a very strong taste, uh, thinner, not so juicy. Uh, for example, watermelon used to be with uh, less um, uh, flesh or less uh, juice. The seeds were bigger and uh, more abundant. The same with the banana. So most of them are very different to the uh, wild uh, ancestor or, or the wild relative that we can find nowadays. That's not the exception with uh, the corn. Uh, maize has this, the closest re wild relative to maize is a grass that is called teocintle. And that is uh, found once again in Mesoamerica, all around Mesoamerica, that it's uh, the, the current countries of Mexico, Guatemala, Belize, Honduras that I mentioned, and even the southern part of the United States as, as well. So the Teocintle grass, as you can see on, on, the, on the pictures here, um, has from five to 10 kernels only on the, on the stem. They are very uh, hard. They are covered with a very hard shell and it's, they are positioned in only one row of kernels, so very different to what we have now with the with the corn, the the cob that we see. 
So how we know that uh, they are relative? Well, because they are a very close related in terms of uh, genetics. They differ a lot in the phenotypical expression. That means how you see the genes expressed. The, the, the teosintlase um, has a, a phenotypical uh, expression more like of a grass, like a weed, actually. It's considered in certain parts of, of the country um, a weed because if you have, um, for example, if you try to to plant este, um, corn, but the seed is, let's say, contaminated with theosintle seeds, you will have theosintle also growing in between the, the corn plants. So they will um, affect, of course, the disposition of nutrients, of water, and they can grow, as you can see, all, with all the ramifications of the plant, they can grow to other places where um, the, the corn cannot get. So they will uh, compete for everything, uh, light, nutrients, water. So, well, they are uh, very close related and uh, I don't want to go deeper on this because it's very scientific, but super, super interesting. Uh, if you want to, to dig more on how they make this, um, how the, the process to make the teosintle into uh, the corn, uh, you can check this. Uh, it's a short documentary, kind of like 20 minutes long, Pop Secret, The Mysterious Origin of Corn. It's uh, on available on YouTube at this um, channel, Bio Interactive. And it's very, very uh, amazing to see how <laughs> actually very little modifications in the genomics of the teosintle give the corn that we know nowadays. So it's a, it's a subject that is still going on their study because this was known until very recently, like 2016 or so. So well, this is still a lot of information that we are getting from these uh, new discoveries. So well, from the Teosintle, we get the uh, corn, the maize that we know uh, nowadays and that we use nowadays. Uh, Actually, both teosintle and, and corn has the same have the same species, sea maize, and they only differ in the subspecies name or the variety that they express, the, the characteristics that they express. The corn uh, that we all think about when, when we say corn uh, has at least 300 different varieties, and uh, it depends uh, shape, size, uh, the kernel uh, color, the type of kernel also, what gives the the name uh, or, or the name to, to the variety, to the type. So, well, this is just like the general um, anatomy, external anatomy of the of the corn plant, very distinctive grass shape, very tall. Uh, something important is um, to learn a little bit about the, the seed, about the kernels. Uh, this is what we use the most for uh, human consumption or for the corn derivatives. So uh, the plant is used sometimes for um, feeding uh, cattle, for example, at least here in Mexico is used for that. Also the, the stem, the stalk is used to get fences in the, in the traditional este, crops here in Mexico as well. And for example, the husk is used in Mexico to have um, uh, handcrafts to, to make uh, dolls or little donkeys or even to make like chairs for kids. Uh, so we can use a lot of the of the um, uh, parts of the of the corn plant, but we usually use only the the grain. So as I mentioned, the classification varies. Had, there are hundreds of names and uh, sometimes it just varies in the degree of sweetness for example or in the color of the grain so all of these names are just a, a short a very little example of the names that you can find um, when you look for uh, varieties of corn and they are classified depending on uh, the precocity how, how long it takes for them to um, be mature as I mentioned, the color of the grain, sweetness, uh, hybridity, and the required growing conditions, because it's not the same 
a, a maize that grows in southern uh, United States as the grain that grows in uh, in central part of Mexico. There are different um, weather conditions, climatic conditions. So also, there's a classification under that. Um, the classification, depending on the type of uh, kernel, for example, it's uh, uh, at least this six, but it can be up to eight or even ten in some, or depending on the on the source that you are looking for. But um, in general, it more than anything uh, because of the size of the grain, because of the content of starch, or um, if the if the outer layer, the peric the, the skin of the of the kernel is thicker or if, if it's um is the thinner so well this is just uh, an example of all of these different types of kernels and uh, how the corns are named after them and in mexico something that i consider to be very very important and that it's uh, another clue that scientists have to tell that um the corn is endemic or is a uh, native uh, the center of origin is in, in Mesoamerica, is that we have 60, more or less, 60 native uh, varieties from those uh, more or less 300 around the world. Um, so these native varieties, if, if you can see the map here, several um, yellow dots, all of those are the, are the land racers or, or the varieties that we have in Mexico. And the color dots, the other color dots, the red, blue, those are the teosintle uh, species that we can find in Mexico. So four of the more or less six or eight teosintle species or varieties are found in Mexico in this area of the, uh, actually this is the, the transvolcanic belt. I have some information about this in one of the previous webinars. But uh, this transvolcanic belt is another uh, mountainous area that goes uh, east to west in Mexico, and is where you can see all of these dots presented. Uh, that that uh, means the Teosintle species varieties are here. So, well, it's that's important because uh, the corn is associated to our culture. Uh, when you think about Mexico, you think about tacos, and tacos are made on a tortilla, on a corn tortilla mostly um so well it's, it's something very important uh, for for our um cultural uh, heritage some uh, corns that i found very interesting uh, i don't know by doing this webinar i realized i don't know anything about corn <laughs> this is something amazing the pod corn or uh, maize ajo like garlic garlic este maize it's a, an endemic, basically, a variety of corn that is cultivated mostly in the in Tlaxcala state, in the central part of Mexico, right next to uh, to Mexico City, in the state of Mexico. Uh, so in this uh, area, they cultivate this kind of, of corn for ornamental purposes only. So you can, um, they don't really export that uh, i have never seen one of these uh, i have never seen them like in real life um so you can think or you, you can realize that cultivating a, a crop like this is a lot of effort a lot of investment but only for um to keep one uh, uh, we call that the genetic pool we call a uh, the the heritage from our ancestors so it's something that i am very very happy to to know and to share with you that this is a doing because they care about the the historical uh, importance of corn in tlaxcala and then i just realized there is a green corn when it's um, like mature it mature it has green color bright green in oaxaca area and uh, if you go and google them actually you can get some uh, shipped back home because they are cultivated very very uh, a lot around the world the world for ornamental purposes as well so uh, the oaxacan green is the uh, the variety 
And uh, well, this is just a couple of, of the calls that I learned that are a very specific area in Mexico. And uh, I, I didn't know about them. <laughs> the one that I did know uh, before is the Hala corn. And I think it's also a very important corn to, to mention because it's the longest, uh, the largest corn in the world. They actually have a contest uh, year after year in which they look for the longest cob. And uh, this year, well, past year, because the, the, the contest is in August, last year, the winner was a cob of 1.6 feet long. So just imagine the size of that thing. It's, uh, and, and you can eat it. That's a great, greatest thing. It's edible, but also the, the husks are used, used for craft. So you have a lot of material to work on it. And uh, well, it's a, a, once again, it's an important crop, specifically this hala corn, because um, it attracts tourism with the, with the contest, with the feria, is the, the La Feria del Elote in Jala Nayarit. And uh, so you have like a lot of um, benefits from having one of these native corns still going in the, in the market, let's say. So you have the contest, so the agriculture, the, the, the farm people, they will look for this uh, type of crop because well, they get a, the, the price is uh, money in this case. So they will, they will get that. Um, also the people like uh, tourism will go there and, and check the area. They, so it's, we have like all of these fa uh, factors being beneficial, but the, the main uh, attraction here is the crop, is the corn. So uh, hala corn. And well, besides the, the eating area or, or the monetary area, the cool area, the cultural uh, factor is also very, very important and very tied to uh, the corn. So for Native uh, Americans, actually also for, for the, 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 the um, uh, Native people on Southern states, uh, all in Mesoamerica and even some in, in South America, Corn was a, a sacred food. It was a sacred uh, plant. For the Mayans, for example, or for the Aztecs, the Mexicas, uh, actually the, the main belief was or is that we come from the corn, that the gods made us from corn. So I wanted to share with you this legend of the Mayans. So it goes that um, at the very beginning when there was only like the skies and the the raw earth with the animals, some uh, gods from the Mayan este, uh, area, they were just saying like the animals were not worshiping, worship them uh, enough that they had the plants and everything, but they needed someone else to give more, um, to thank more for the, for the goods. So they decided to create the, the man, the humankind. At the very beginning, they made the humans from mud. They tried to make them like from clay, but without uh, the, the oven step. So they were just making these mud uh, dolls. And they were so soft that when the human of mud was trying to walk, it was just falling on pieces. They, were, they, they didn't have a soul. They were not able to worship the gods. They were not able to um, take care of the land. So they basically just were dissolving on, on the same earth. Then they decided to make a human kind of uh, wood, of sticks, but they were very stiff. They could not move very much. They could not uh, speak uh, uh, well enough to worship them again. And uh, once again, if there was a, a fire, they will burn very fast. If there was a, 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 a lot of water, they will rot rotten and die so they decided to uh, to to uh, eliminate them to finish with the uh, wood men and uh, actually a part of that legend says that the ones that were able to survive became monkeys so that that's uh, like another explanation on why we have men and we have monkeys because the the wood men that survived became monkeys so they were just like thinking like what should we do now? What what other um, material can we use to create a, a perfect 
perfect being for uh, worship us and for taking care of the of the land. And they saw the corn, so they decided to make the man from the masa, from the corn uh, dog. And uh, since well, there are several different colors of corn, that's how we have several different colors of our skin in the humankind. So at the end, that was the, the best uh, the decision according to the Mayan gods, and we are now the, the corn people. So uh, with, the, with the Mexica uh, cosmology or the Aztec cosmology, there are plenty of gods that are related to the corn. These are the ones that I consider to be the three more most important. Shilonen uh, and Senteotl, the one on the left and, and on the right of the screen. Uh, those are basically the corn in a certain stage of the development. For example, Shilonen is a feminine god, is a, is a goddess, and she represents uh, the, the fresh corn, like the tender corn before it is mature, because if it, if it, it is a, a virgin goddess. And then Sinteotl means uh, the corn where it's mature, when it's ready to be harvest, and the one that uh, gives um, the energy and, and the, the, um, the life power to the people or, or the life essence to the people, Sinteotl. But then we have Shipetotec, that is a, a very, what would it be? Um, este ambivalent or dual a very dual um is the god the the meaning of chipetotec is our lord the flayed one so if you pay attention you can see the god has a skin another human skin on it but is on him but it is his own skin that he took off and then he put on again something like that so he represents the duality or, or the cycle of life, or dead and rebirth then, that is associated to the agricultural cycles of the crops, specifically of the, of the corn, of the maize, maize. So it's just the same. When you plant the seed and then you have the plant, but then you harvest it and then it dies. But from the seed that this plant gave you, you can have another plant. So is this cycle, the rebirth, uh, uh, the cycle of, of, uh, of the life itself and um, he represented also the the shredded corn by when he takes his skin means or, or represents the corn when you take the husk from the ear and then uh, the grains are like the the body the, the flesh but then if you cover like in mexico we make the tamales if you cover again the the masa uh, dog you have like the shipetotec representation of the skin of his own skin again on him i don't know if that makes sense but uh it's very complex um th this cosmology so well this is just like a very short example of the import of the, the cult cultural importance uh of the corn for the ancient people here in in mesoamerica specifically mayan and, and mexicas and aztecs and uh, another thing that is important I just remember is that the the Mesoamerican people, or at least the Aztec people, based the the life of of the citizens, the life of the city, uh, and and the wars and everything, celebrations, the rituals, everything was based on the crop cycle. Uh, for example, when the people was in a field, like preparing the soil or planting seeds. They had like this time off from wars or time off from construction. After harvest is when most of the people was ready to uh, do other things. So they plan, they have wars planned based on the crop cycle and also the construction of uh, the cities, uh, the pyramids and stuff. They were also based on um, the crop cycle. So just for you to to realize how important this was for um, is the, the Mesoamerican cultures. Even it's not only important for for Mesoamerican cultures, but also for the pop culture that we have now. Uh, the these modern uh, the times are uh, where the corn is also very very important. 
just think about going to the movie theater and being there smelling the, the popcorns that are freshly made. So it's something so common is associated also to is the, the, the corn. And well, we have plenty of movies that use the corn as the, like this, uh, as uh, the, the main scenario. Is the, even in the Simpson, in the Simpson family, also we can see when they are having the, the corns and Disney movies like Pocahontas as well. So, well, just for you to know how um, inside the culture corn is. So uh, nowadays, this, this is a global uh, crop. As you can see, the corn production is uh, in, in the world is, uh, it varies a lot depending where we are. And the United States is number one in, in the world in production of corn. Uh, Mexico, despite being so important for Mexicans, is on number five, more or less. It varies every year, but it can be from three, between three and seven, moving up and down. So uh, let me just show you a little bit specifically about the United States, the corn usage. Most of the corn that is produced in the United States, and it, this can be extrapolated to the world, most of the corn that we use, that we um, harvest in the world is used to feed uh, basically any any other um, livestock uh, that we can use. So um, most of it, almost 40% uh, or a little bit more 40% is used for that. And then another part is used for ethanol and, and other products in this industry and on and on. So something very, if you remember that I, that I mentioned on the plant uh, area of the corn, something very important is to keep in mind is that we use mostly the kernel. From the kernel is that is where um, we take most of the, of the ingredients to process the, the corn and make this, all these uh, corn uh, derivatives. And, many, many things. We will explore a little bit of, uh, of those. But well, just for you to know like where this comes from, the, 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 the cob, when, when you take the kernel off, is the, the stalk, the leaves, is the, the husks, all of those are either processed for another thing, such as fibers, or they can be uh, uh, fed to the, to the cattle, to the livestock as well. So um, just this is, as, as the image says, this is just the tip of the stock. <laughs> very huge, very broad usage of the corn soup products. For example, uh, the, the corn, it has certain soup products that can be used as binding compounds for the fireworks to burn properly. So I have never thought about that. Uh, adhesives also when you make uh, when, when people is making the books some of the adhesives have uh, also binding compounds from the corn solvents are also extracted from a certain process from a, a, a another is the, um, uh, element of the corn among others in medicine i have never thought about that in medicine they use bonding agents also for the for the pills for the aspirin, for example, for, for any other tablet uh, in medicine, um, the, the corn syrup, for example, is added also to some coughing syrups, so to some coughing medicine for it to taste better for the kids, for example. Um, what else? The starch uh, combined with other things and processed in, in other ways is also used for a protective, um, is the, bandages in in medicine then the in the, i had never had idea of this they add also another subproduct of the cornstarch to the diapers the, the disposable diapers that are now uh, more like bio friendly environmentally friendly they have some certain compounds that help the absorption on the diapers um on the cosmetics even on this in the hand soap uh, on industry, well, that's a little bit more uh, maybe common, or you have seen that more like is the um, uh, you can touch it, that you can see it. Uh, the bioplastics, 
Uh, we have seen a lot of these disposable uh, uh, cups and um, plates that are made of corn, something, uh, a, a, a product that is from the corn. So uh, a lot of the corn starch in a process that are used also for the molding processes. If you have a mold and then you're adding, este, I don't know, plastic or, or rubber or whatever, then you, you need something to make this um, more easily removed. So there's plenty of things. And of course, well, food, that's the one of the main things. The, the corn is, uh, is in the food industry, but not only as the cob, also processed and also some of the, of the derivatives that are added to the everyday meal that you have. So, the corn is important in this specifically on the food industry is important uh not only on the on the processed um is the ingredients that we can use uh, afterwards but the corn itself has several minerals several vitamins that uh, we can use that we need actually and uh, i will i will show you in a moment a video one second very important and uh so the the thing here is that we cannot get most of these uh, nutrients from the corn directly. We need to have a process to make them bioavailable. I don't know if that makes sense. So that means that they can be, let's say, um, free in the corn, so our body can absorb it. And for that, that's something very important that comes once again from Mesoamerican areas. It's a process named nixtamalization. So um, I'm going to show you this this video on my phone because with this uh, I, I was not able to do it online on the screen. But um, is the Sony? If you can help me, just if you don't hear it or see it, let me know, please. I'm I'm going to play it. Um, how's the nixtamalization process is? very interesting and i remember seeing this when i was a kid back home in in guadalajara city and going to the tortilleria and to the to the is the meal and just like seeing everything like the the kernels and the water and being drained and it was like super common to me but i didn't have idea of why it was so important so here it goes this whole process annual consumption of Normally maize produced by the okay, family, one, annual one, consumption one. of tortillas in Mexico is estimated at 120 kilograms per capita. Household process. Normally maize produced by the family or locally is used. In Mexico, it is common that farmers use the same type of maize through generations. Maize is cleaned by hand and lime is purchased in the local market. The lime is fired with hot water before use. The maize is mixed with water and lime and cooked for an hour or so, depending on how hard the kernels are, using either gas or even fire. The maize is then steeped for 14 to 16 hours to create the finished product, called nixtamal. The nixtamal is then ground by hand using a metate, a pre-Hispanic grindstone made of volcanic rock, or milled in the local millers, which is most popular nowadays. Water is added to fresh nixtamal to create masa or maize dough, which is then formed into tortillas, either by hand or in a tortilla press. The raw tortillas are then placed on a comal, traditional Mexican iron griddle, cooked on one side and flipped. Once the tortilla has inflated, it is ready to be taken off the comal and stored in a covered container so that it remains warm and soft. Average tortilla consumption in Mexico is two tortillas per day for preschool children, four tortillas per four to eight year old child, and eight to 10 tortillas per adult. Maize tortillas provide more than 35% of protein, 45% of calories, and almost 50% of calcium to the population's diet. Industrial nixtamalization. Okay, so... The two main main... I hope you can see and... Uh, so and, and... Okay. See and, and hear this uh, very well. And, uh, well, 
Uh, that process specifically is. Oh, wait, 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 what's going on? No. Okay. Uh, I have a. One moment, please. I just want to. Okay. Bueno. Um, one second, one second, please. I don't know what is moving like that. Um, no, nothing. Okay. Okay, that's yeah, that's that's important. I want this to go away so fast. Um, so this uh nixtamalization process, as the video mentioned, is very important in terms of opening, let's say opening the kernel to leave the nutrients available for our body to to be consumed. As uh, the video mentioned, almost 50% of the calcium from a for a regular human is the diet is uh, available once that you have the, the tortillas or, or the masa prepared through the nixtamalization process. So if this is another whole uh, topic on its own. Uh, I strongly recommend you to go in this uh, in this website, CIMIT or CIMMYT.org, and check uh, all the programs and all the projects that they have to improve um the the food is the um, the the food security in the world and uh, how the nixtamalization can help on prevent malnutrition on uh, areas in in the in countries that people really needs an extra uh, boost in their diet so strongly recommended to go either on the youtube channel of the organization or directly on the website many of things and actually they have some uh, volunteer projects that you can go and help and it, you can get more in touch with this part of the of the corn and uh, well wheat in this case also and well let me we're almost on the last uh, last moment of the webinar let me just go over this very fast uh, the mexican gastronomy once again, when you see, uh, let's go and eat some Mexican food, you think about, I don't know, guacamole and nachos. So the nachos are tortilla chips. Tortilla comes from the corn. But there are more than 600 recipes that are based on corn, not only the tortilla and all the, this, the soup, uh, dishes that we can have from a tortilla, from the tacos, enchiladas, or este, um, flautas, um and everything you can put uh, anything on that in a tortilla but also we have a uh, drinks with made with corn we have of, of course soups we have uh, the tamales that are very popular so let me just show you some of the of the recipes that i consider to be um very important but maybe not so well known outside of mexico the tejuino this is a drink it's a fermented uh, uh, masa uh, dough, masa harina, and uh, it's not alcoholic despite being a fermented drink. Very refreshing. Usually, I, I remember drinking this almost every every other day in Guadalajara in summer, because it's a it's a drink that uh, is most known on the western side of Mexico rather than in in central or or other areas of Mexico. So, um, I. This is, you can make tejuino at home. It's so easy to make that you can make it at home. If you want to try, I strongly recommend you go to this uh, website. This is one of the most accurate recipes that I could find of the tejuino. Um, then another uh, meal that is derived, uh, is the based on corn is the pozole. Pozole is a little bit more complex to, to make. Uh, it takes sometimes uh, uh, three hours to prepare like the whole thing and actually have the the dish prepared. Um, but well, once again, it's very uh, common and, and not so difficult to make. So if you want to try, I strongly, once again, this is something very del delicious. You can try this uh, website. Again, this is one of the most accurate uh recipes of pozole and you can have also vegan pozole you can change some of the ingredients like the pork or the chicken uh, broth uh, for veggie broth or uh, the um, mushrooms as well so it's something very delicious to try and well the tamales tamales are just uh, something so so traditional since ancient times 
And you can have tamales, tamales of any kind. You can have a uh, sweet, you can have uh, spicy tamales, you can have uh, tamales on the on the corn husk or banana leaves co este cover. Um, you can have them uh, sweet, it can be strawberry, you can mix that up with any fruit. So you can have a tamal made of, uh, you name it, guava or um, cheese tamal or just the sweet corn tamal that are very delicious. So once again, this is uh, the, the green chili corn and cheese tamale from uh, the channel Sassy Scrapper is the one that I found to be the most accurate and easier for you back home in the States or outside of Mexico, where you cannot find or you could not ha have the uh, local ingredients, but maybe the, the substitute of that. And well, just to, to wrap this up, um, coming soon, I'm going to have a talk about the milpa. The milpa is a crop system very popular also since uh, since centuries ago in Mesoamerican area. Uh, it's also known as the Three Sisters crop system. So uh, this one is something that modern farmers are looking uh, looking for because it makes a like a more environmental friendly and in a long term beneficial. A agricultural uh, system. So, well, I'll go deeper on that for the for the next webinar, uh, the upcoming webinar next week. Uh, but well, just for you to know that this is something that uh, we're still not over. <laughs> so, basically, that would be it. Thank you very much, Sonny. Back to you, Melissa. Thank you so much. Oh, it's so interesting so to learn so much about the cultural significance of corn, something that we just kind of take for granted in our day to day. Uh, most of the time. So thank you for sharing that with us. Before we thank start the Q&A, I want to remind everyone that they can submit their questions via the questions field in the control panel. Um, let's see. When tortillas are turned, tortillas by, hand, are turned by hand during cooking, during do the cooking, people burn their fingers? So, yeah, I used to burn my fingers. <laughs> so yes, you need a lot of practice. Usually the the, the master ladies that are, or men, even a lot of men know how to do the tortilla este, turning. Uh, since they are making the tortilla on the same, uh, um, with the dog and then just going to the comal, they already have some masa on their hands. So it makes like a protective layer. That's what I have noticed and I have seen. But if you don't have practice, of course, you, you get some burn. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the use of the word lime is a little confusing. Mm -hmm. Do tortillas have lime from citrus or from the cement? No, lime, lime like the rock, like the, like the, is the geological term. So yeah, the lime for the nixtamalization, it's a, a powder, it's not a citric. Let me, let me go back here. Oh, I, we don't see it. But yeah, here a little bit, you can see the water is white during the steep process. So that lime is the limestone. Okay, thank you for clarifying. That was confusing because we yes. tend to think of citrus lime as, as one of the main ingredients. <laughs> As the only lime. No, in this case, in the nixtamalization, is limestone what you add to the to the water on the on the um, boiling process. Okay, interesting. So fascinating. Um, that's the last question we have. We'll give it just another minute and see if another question comes in. But um, I was just so amazed at how stunning all the colors were. Yeah, all the colors. They're just absolutely yes. gorgeous. Absolutely gorgeous. Yes. Yeah. If you if if you or our viewers go on a quick google search um just like colors of corn you'll have like hundreds of colors and mixes and then uh because in one whole co in, in one uh, color like the oaxacan green that i showed you they were they were explaining and where i found the, the information that you can have a pretty much like lime green like lime the citrus uh, green to dark green, to malachite green. 
So just imagine having like all of those uh, varieties or or tones uh, of colors, the Pantone of of the of the corn. So this is just something mind blowing. It's so neat. One more question: um, Does yes. the lime does the lime, as in limestone, contribute to the calcium in masa? Yeah. Contributes to uh huh break uh, the the kernel and soften it and expose the calcium. So the calcium that that we consume from the nixtamalization process comes from the corn, not from the lime, because you actually drain the water where you cook the grain. You rinse. I remember watching the the grains being rinsed until the water was clear, pretty much what, what some people do with the rice, that you are rinsing the, the rice and the water has a color and until it's clearer is when you use it, pretty much the same with the with the corn. So you have the, the grain cooking with the limestone and then after the steeping process, you have to rinse it and rinse it and rinse it and then you process the, the, the corn to make the masa dough. So, some chemical process, physical process occurs when you have the limestone and the boiling water with the corn that makes the calcium available. But the calcium comes from the, the corn grain. The calcium, calcium coin comes from the, the endosperm, from the germ, from inside the, car, the, the kernel, not the lime, because you... Uh, you you dispose the water from from the cooking mm. so interesting okay one more um yes what can you tell us about the genetics of jumping genes to understand the different colors mm -hmm. see it's a uh, 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 um in here they mention it a little bit clearer and more technical but yeah, what uh, what the people here found out is that these um, these genes were in a the jumping gene were in a very small amount. So basically, uh, with just one gene that was modified or what was um, active in the corn, you were able to have a different color of corn because. I mean, even if you have, for example, the sweet corn that is widely consumed in the in the U.S. can come also in white color. You have the yellow color that is like the most popular or commercialized one, but it also comes with exactly the same characteristics in white color. And that happens only with one single part of the genome. So I don't know if that was like the, the question, but yeah, it's uh, pretty much just one a jumping gene that makes the corn different from one variety to another. I don't know if that was clear. I think so. I think so. Thank yeah. you so much. Okay. <laughs> I'm gonna turn it I'm gonna turn it back to you for closing comments. Yeah well no it was uh, very amazing it's the amazing to <laughs> to present this to you. Uh, anytime that you have the chance to try um a different type of corn please take that 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 opportunity uh, if you come to mexico if you are near the mexican border also try to look for a uh, native corn somewhere and just uh, be adventurous because this, this is something that is um it has evolved with us as a as a civilization as as the webinar title says so don't don't leave it behind Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. I also want to thank everybody who tuned in. Please join us tomorrow for our next Daily Dose of Nature. You can check out this week's lineup, including registration links, on our website at nathab.com forward slash webinars. We did record today's presentation, and we will have the replay available on our website soon. With that, we'll conclude the webinar. Have a wonderful day, everyone.